Okay. So welcome everybody to our Learning Analytics Learning Network event. Uh, the goal of the Learning Analytics Learning Network is to build capacity for the field of learning analytics by leveraging efforts that are currently taking place and existing communities around the globe. And we're sharing these with a worldwide network. And we've had a number of different events this year. Uh, we had uh, in, uh, in, in August, we had Brian Baker, um, he presented on uh, feature engineering a, in September, um, a few weeks ago. We had uh, Dr. Pete Smith and Henry Anderson from University of Texas at Arlington present on a natural language understanding. We also have a few upcoming events um, on the website that I'll post here in a minute um, on uh, writing analytics that'll be out of a, uh, Sydney, um, Simon Buckingham Shum and Shabani Antoinette. Um, we also have um, another event out of Georgetown that will be on November 12th. Um, that'll be at Georgetown University, and that'll be Yolani Bolides and Aaron Hoya. So we invite you to uh, join those events, and uh, thank you for coming today. So I'm going to go ahead and post a couple of resources into the chat if you're not familiar with it. Um, I've posted our um, website uh, that you can see all uh, different events. Um, we do put posts up there, um, as well as uh, the Twitter uh, handle, so you can follow us there, um, as well as the resource hub. And the resource hub, if you want to continue to have discussions um, after the event, I'm sure uh, Nigel will be happy to have you reach out. Um, but if you also would like to take, uh, have some, some chats in the discussion forum on the resources we posted there as well. So, um, you know, if you also are interested in joining the Learning Analytics Learning Network, um, hosting events and those sorts of things, there's more information on the website to do so there. So. Um, Ultimately, you're not here to hear much about that. Uh, you're here to see uh, Nigel and the talk on hyperparameter tuning in machine learning for student models. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Nigel. Awesome, thank you. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, this problem of hyperparameter tuning, uh, specifically in the context of educational uh, data mining or uh, uh, learning analytics used specifically for machine learning kinds of purposes. So to start off very broadly, we have this problem when we're doing um, any kind of machine learning application, uh, which is that uh, often what works well for one machine learning problem, uh, by which we mean some set of um, inputs, we have like student behaviors that we want to use to predict a, a student outcome. Um, that doesn't always, uh, the same thing doesn't necessarily work for one problem very well um, on another problem, even if they might be um, fairly related. Um, so reasons why that could be um, are numerous. Uh, things like incompatibility, um, for example, maybe you just have um, uh, completely uh, or subtly different kinds of data um, that are simply not a good fit for the type of, of method that you use on one um, on one problem, uh, or we might have more uh, more subtly difficult problems to deal with, like the uh, the topology of the data may be different. By which I mean the the way the data are distributed in uh, feature space in terms of the features that you've engineered may be um, some kind of different shape that is uh, more or less suited to um, one particular method. Uh, or the uh, the topography of the data might be different, by which I mean, um, in particular, the um, the shape of the error function that you're trying to minimize for uh, for some particular problem, uh, since that is influenced by the uh, by the data that gets put in uh, to your uh, machine learning model. And so we're trying to uh, we'd like to solve this problem as best as possible. Uh, to uh, to have methods that are adaptable or, or methods that we can tune from uh, from one problem to another related problem um, so that we can choose the appropriate method for the particular problem. But this brings up the no free lunch theorem, which is one of my favorite uh, theorems in machine learning because it, it uh, uh, saves you a lot of uh, of fear of missing out on all the latest, greatest uh, methods. Um, the no, no free lunch theorem uh, proves that in the infinite space of possible data sets you could encounter, no optimization strategy is better than any other strategy. Um, and all machine learning algorithms are uh, basically just different 
optimization strategies to try to optimize some kind of function that learns the relationship between your inputs and the thing that you're trying to predict. So what that says essentially is that no machine learning algorithm is better than any other machine learning algorithm across all uh, possible problems. So even technically for seemingly terrible strategies, you can find a case, a data set, where the terrible strategy works best. So for example, a common way to train a, um, a model like a neural network or even a logistic regression is via um, gradient descent, where you try to find the minimum of a function by stepping down the gradient of the, uh, the loss or the error. Um, so you could do the opposite and do gradient ascent and intentionally tr try to find a bad solution and that might still give you the, the minimum or one of several minima um, in, uh, in a data set if it had the, uh, the right shape for that particular strategy. So for example, a data set might consist of uh, a, a data set plus an optimization strategy plus an algorithm might consist of exclusively uh, minima, the things you want to find surrounded by maxima, the exact opposite, like the really bad solutions. So kind of like a volcano uh, with a deep, narrow lava shaft. Uh, and I have a terrible hand-drawn picture of, of, uh, of one of those. Um, so you can imagine if this is your data set, you want to uh, find a solution at the bottom of the uh, lava shaft, but you're going to start out somewhere on the mountain somewhere, uh, probably not in the ideal position, um, and have to find your way, uh, learn your way towards the, uh, the optimum. So a, a typical algor algorithm would do something like uh, go down the mountain and you would find eventually a local minimum, but you would miss this uh, global optimum. It's very deep, uh, uh, narrow uh, shaft of uh, um, of the problem space. So uh, that's just to illustrate that um, a, a strategy that makes sense, like going downhill to try and get to a, the lowest elevation isn't always going to work. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what the no free lunch theorem uh, proves is that uh, in general, no strategy is better than any other strategy. So why does machine learning even work then? Um, if no strategy is better than random guessing, for example. Uh, because in practice, data sets are usually uh, thoughtfully constructed. They aren't uh, randomly drawn from the space of all possible data sets. Um, and in particular, usually the features of your data set are probably going to have some kind of directional relationship, um, even if that's a very complicated nonlinear relationship um, with your labels, the thing you're trying to figure out, or uh, there will be some good solution that consists of relatively uh, independent uh, different pieces of a solution, um, in which case you don't need directional relationships. You can use uh, something called derivative-free optimization. Um, things like genetic algorithms are examples of methods that implement derivative-free optimization so that you do not uh, need to have some kind of, of uh, directional relationship or slope um, of your problem space. But there's still some, some restrictions on what kind of problem is going to work well in that scenario. Uh, but typically, when we're, when we're making a data set, we have some uh, hypothesis, even if it's just implicitly in our own minds, of what a um, uh, what the relationship is between our features and the outcome uh, that we're going for. So uh, if, you, uh, if you're trying to engineer some kind of feature for uh, what predicting whether a student is uh, going to get an A on the final exam, you might look at their previous quiz scores uh, and you'd probably assume that, uh, that those quiz scores are going to have some kind of positive relationship with uh, their final exam score as well. So machine learning works because we, we tend to bake those kinds of assumptions into the, uh, into the data set. Um, and we're not just randomly drawing uh, knowledge from, the, from 
uh, the space of all random data sets. But there are still many different possible optimization strategies you could pick from, many, many, many different kinds of machine learning algorithms um, and variations of those algorithms, um, each of which could be the best strategy for your particular data set. So you still have this problem of which one is going to be good for your specific data set. So for example, if the data um, in both your features and your instances are actually uh, truly independent of, e of each other, statistically independent and monotonically related to your labels, then there's no better possible classifier than a naive Bayes uh, classifier, uh, assuming you have the right distribution to match that monotonic relationship. So a very simple model can actually be, uh, you can prove that it is the best uh, possible model given the right uh, uh, assumptions about your data set. Usually things are not quite so simple though. Um, so usually you need some kind of uh, experimentation because you don't know necessarily what the ideal um, uh, model is going to be for your particular data set. So uh, what machine learning uh, can actually learn in, uh, in your particular uh, problem is just function optimization. So machine learning just uh, tries to minimize some uh, error function typically. Um, so it requires an error function to optimize. So usually this is a function of some input features, some predictive variables that you've engineered from your data set that give you some output label. So some simple function f of x where x is your your features um, equals y, where y is your, uh, your labels and the thing you want to predict. And that f of x function could be linear, um, piecewise linear, um, piecewise constant, or some other um, infinitely many different uh, forms of uh, functions. Um, and it's hard to know in advance what that, uh, what that right function is. But that's all that machine learning can do is optimize a given function. And so it's up to you essentially to decide what that function is. And that's exactly what the uh, hyperparameter optimization process is. So um, that, that decision about this, the left side of this equation, what the function is, what the inputs to the function is, are all choices that you um, as the uh, the learning analyst make. And those are uh, the hyperparameters. So the, the machine learning algorithm learns the parameters of that function, but everything else about the model, like what function it is in the first place, aka like what classifier or regressor you're using, and the inputs, those are all hyperparameters because those are parameters that are decided by you um, not by the, um, not learned by the machine learning algorithm. So for example, in random forests, we um, have to make decisions like how many trees should be in the forest um, and how deep should those trees be allowed to grow? And maybe should we do some kind of pr pruning of the trees to reduce overfitting and many, many other possible uh, hyperparameters that, uh, that you could choose when you're setting up your model. Uh, even for logistic regression, uh, you may want to add some kind of regularization, again, to re reduce overfitting uh, and decide how much regularization you should add. Um, and for things like deep neural networks, there are uh, almost inconceivably many hyperparameters because you have to decide things like how many layers deep is your neural network. That's one hyperparameter. Uh, what uh, regularization should you add and to which layers, what learning rate should you use, um, how big should the layers be, how should they be connected, um, and all of these different decisions. Those are all things that, uh, that the model does not learn typically um, and that you as the experimenter are specifying. So they're all hyperparameters that you uh, need to tune. So hyperparameters are just the aspects of the model uh, that are not learned as part of the model fitting process, including what features go into the model uh, and what classifier you, you use 
Um, and so, for example, a support vector machine with C, the regularization uh, hyperparameter of a support vector machine, is in some ways um, a completely different model than um, a support vector machine with a different regularization uh, hyperparameter value. Um, and there are some classifiers where that can really be taken to an extreme where a change of hyperparameter is going to cause the classifier to learn a, a dramatically different kind of um, decision boundary or regression line. Um, so you can think of these all, all hyperparameters essentially as different kinds of uh, machine learning models, if you like. Uh, and typically, these hyperparameters are non-differentiable, so they don't have a, um, a gradient or a derivative uh, in calculus terms. So they can't be optimized via gradient descent or um, other popular strategies for, uh, for machine learning the way the models themselves are uh, typically fit. So instead, we have to use some other kind of strategy for hyperparameter optimization. So some of these things that you might want to, um, to fit are things like regularization. So any kind of limitation um, that you impose on a model to control the complexity of that model is called uh, regularization. So things like um, L1 or L2 regularization that constrain the weights of a regression or a uh, neural network model, or the maximum depth of a decision tree, for example, or, um, or SVM uh, regularization or many other uh, possible parameters. Um, these are all types of regularization. So that's one hyperparameter you have to choose. Should you use regularization and what type? And then you also have to know what strength of hyperparameter uh, you want. So basically, how much do you want to enforce one of these uh, constraints on the model? Um, so uh, there are also many, uh, many other kinds of hyperparameters, like for a tree, um, how, um, how many instances per leaf should be allowed and how deep should the be tree be allowed to grow? Um, these are all kinds, uh, or these are kind of regularization parameters, uh, but there are many other uh, variations of those as well. Um, in random forests, um, they have essentially the same hyperparameters as trees, since the forest is made up out of trees. Um, but um, there are also other hyperparameters that you can tune. So hy some hyperparameters related to the bias variance trade-off, the things like the proportion of instances used for each tree. Uh, so if you select fewer instances per tree, you're going to have um, each tree is going to be um, a bit uh, worse, probably. It won't be as well fit to the data, but it will be more independent from the other trees. Um, so that will, um, that will be helpful in its own way. Or the proportion of columns used for each tree, same thing. If you use fewer columns, uh, each tree will be probably less predictive or less well fit to the data set, but will be more independent from the other trees so that the forest will gain more from voting among those trees. So the, those trade-offs are uh, a couple of hyperparameters that have to be tuned in random forest as well if you want to get um, uh, the best results that you could. Um, or even the, like the number of trees this is actually a hyperparameter that I see people tune frequently, that uh, there actually isn't a super good theoretical reason to tune this hyperparameter, uh, because the main trade-off is just uh, that uh, a higher number of trees usually theoretically is going to work better, but it takes longer to compute. So generally, I would just set this one to a high value um, and uh, don't try to actually tune it unless it's um, too high and it takes too long. Uh, so gradient boosting is another uh, popular method, uh, especially uh, lately for some uh, learning analytics applications. Um, and this has the same hyperparameters as a random forest, um, including all of the decision tree hyperparameters. Um, although often the number of trees in a gradient boosting model is set to one. Um, so in gradient boosting, uh, we're learning a model that consists of many different trees where 
each tree addresses the problems or the errors made by, uh, by the trees that came before it. So the leftover errors um, from, the, from the previous sub models. Um, and each one of those, um, each one of those additional trees typically has a smaller impact on the model by some uh, ratio to prevent overfitting to these uh, tiny little leftover errors. So that's where the learning rate parameter comes in uh, because you want each successive round of adding trees to have a smaller impact on the prediction. And then it has even more regularization options you could explore uh, like a, a gamma regularization and an L1 and L2 regularization um, and uh, the, the list goes on. There are so many hyperparameters you could possibly tune. Uh, it gets a little bit uh, overwhelming. Uh, but some, sometimes those are necessary to adjust to get a, a decent result. Um, SVMs, uh, in my experience, are especially sensitive to the hyperparameter settings. So one of those is C or the complexity parameter that controls how uh, complicated the, uh, the decision boundary can be or really how complicated the transformation of your data can be. Um, and uh, what kernel to use. So often uh, we'll just have two choices in a lot of, of uh, machine learning software between a radial basis function, which is based on a um, a Gaussian distribution and a polynomial kernel, which is based on uh, measuring all of the uh, uh, second or third or more order interactions between variables. So if you use the, uh, the RBF uh, kernel, then you have this additional hyperparameter gamma that controls the, uh, the shape of the uh, Gaussian distribution that you're using to uh, to modify your data, to add dimensionality. And for the polynomial kernel, you have to control the, uh, the degree of the polynomial or the interactions that you have between different variables. So there are several hyperparameters, um, and I think SVMs are uh, especially sensitive to the values of these parameters. It can take some, uh, some experimenting for sure to find good solutions um, uh, to, to these hyperparameters. Um, in contrast, in a lot of educational data sets, in my experience at least, uh, it seems like uh, things like a uh, random forest and logistic regression are maybe not as uh, sensitive to the hyperparameters that you choose. Um, but that brings up a, an important key point, which is that for many types of models, it is uh, indeed really uh, critical to pick good parameters or the model may not fit well um, to your data at all. So for example, this is a, a real world example from a, an SVM model from an experiment uh, that I did some years ago, uh, where with the um, with the complexity parameter set to one. So uh, uh, that makes a, a relatively simple model, um, at, depending on your, your data set. Actually, this is somewhat relative to your data set, but compared to uh, a value 1,000 times larger, this makes a very simple model. Um, and in this case, it was unable to um, fit any kind of meaningful decision boundary and simply classified everything as the majority class. So a bit of a, of a failure. Uh, uh, conversely, with the complexity cranked way up, uh, the model classified every single training instance perfectly. Um, so it way overfit the model and uh, picked a very zigzag kind of uh, transformation to, um, to fit the, the training data perfectly, but then it didn't really uh, work at all on the testing data because it was so uh, grossly overfit. So somewhere in between those two values uh, did actually work uh, pretty well. So that's just an illustration of the kind of impact that uh, changes to the hyperparameters can make. In the case of SVMs, you can go from a model that is too simple to work all the way up to a model that perfectly uh, overfits to the entire uh, training data set. Um, so uh, the, the key idea when we're trying to uh, fit hyperparameters is to get the cross-validation strategy correct. 
So um, in some cases, we can uh, we can try everything, all of the possible hyperparameter combinations that we want to do. Um, in which case, that's called grid search because you can imagine with two dimensions, you have one hyperparameter, say on the, the y-axis, and one on the x-axis, and you can try every combination of x and y um, in a grid, and that applies to more dimensions as well. Um, so if you if you have the time and the computational budget for that, uh, you you can run that approach. That tends to uh, uh, be one of the uh, certainly one of the preferable pro approaches if you have the time for it. Um, so in this case, we we would want to split our training data. So we have some overall um, uh, data set that consists of some training data and some testing data. Uh, but we want to pick the hyperparameters using only the training data, uh, which is a very, very uh, crucial uh, difference. Um, and a later time permitting, I will show some uh, examples with uh, some data uh, of the, the effects of, of doing this uh, incorrectly. But usually what we would do, uh, hopefully, is uh, pick some of the data, a subset of the training data, to actually train our models with some particular set of hyperparameters, um, and then validate that. So we, we see how well did the uh, did that set of hyperparameters work on the validation data, which is again just a subset of our overall training data, and then continue that over and over again for all uh, hyperparameter values until we um, have decided which ones work best based on the validation data, and then retrain using those hyperparameters on all of the uh, training data, and then finally apply that model and only that model to the testing data. So a way not to pick hyperparameters is to try a bunch of different choices, like different classifiers and different hyperparameters, um, and pick the one that works best on the testing data. So if you do that, uh, you'll probably overfit your hyperparameters to the, uh, to the testing data. So you may have tenfold cross-validation, um, and your model is only trained based on the training data. But if you've um, chosen all of those uh, hyperparameters or what classifier to use, even based on the cross-validated testing performance, then your choice of, of classifier and hyperparameters is overfit to that particular data set and may not uh, generalize to very well to new data collected from the, the same problem. So an uh, example with an SVM of how we would do uh, something like this uh, grid search um, in a, uh, a more correct way is we have these values, example values of the complexity parameter that we might want to try and uh, maybe four different values of the polynomial degree that we want to try. So we have a grid of uh, four polynomial degrees by uh, six different uh, complexity values. So we have 24 different combinations of hyperparameters to try out. And that's why it can get pretty computationally uh, com complex. Every new hyperparameter adds a new dimension to this grid. Um, and the space of models that you have to train can um, get a bit out of hand pretty quickly. So for example, um, with XGBoost, a gradient boosting method, uh, this is a subset of hyperparameters um, that I used in a, a recent uh, experiment where I ran XG, uh, used XGBoost for a, a, a learning analytics problem. And I had quite a few different hyperparameters that I felt um, were probably necessary to explore uh, for this data set. It was a pretty big data set, so I thought I could probably afford to, to try quite a few combinations. But if we look at these, there are so many different hyperparameter dimensions here. I even left some out because uh, there are at, at least a couple more that I could have added. Um, but I thought this would be enough. Um, and it, certainly, it was far too many to actually be able to try uh, grid search. 
So there's 1.6 million uh, different combinations of those hyperparameters, and each model uh, might take a, um, a few seconds to train. So uh, I can't afford uh, a few seconds times 1.6 million, uh, or it'll, uh, it'll never be finished in a reasonable amount of time. So there are different strategies uh, that have been researched for searching huge hyperparameter spaces like that. One of which is random search. Um, and the idea of random search is that you simply um, choose from among uh, all of the many, many combinations in that huge hyperparameter space, um, some random set. So you might say, I will choose, uh, I can afford to, choose, to run, say, 500 different models. So you'll randomly choose some throughout the uh, hyperparameter space. Um, and that has the, the advantage that you, you have a fixed budget of the number of, of uh, hyperparameters that you're willing to explore, number of models that you want to tune. And then in theory, adding a new hyperparameter to the mix doesn't really um, negatively affect your search uh, too much, unless that has um, a large proportion of values that are simply not uh, good values uh, worth exploring for your uh, particular data set. Another strategy is coordinate descent, which is where we uh, take one hyperparameter and find the best value for that hyperparameter, leaving all the other ones at their default values, and then move on to the next hyperparameter and keeping whatever was the best value from the first one, trying all of the possible values for the second hyperparameter uh, and finding the best value for that, and then uh, so on through the hyperparameters. Uh, and then maybe starting over at the beginning. Um, so given that all of the rest of the hyperparameters now have uh, slightly different values. Um, and actually, by the way, that's the method that I ended up using on uh, this problem where we have uh, 1.6 million hyperparameters. So with a coordinate descent, we can go through all of these um, hyperparameter values in a very reasonable amount of time. Uh, we just don't explore all of the combinations. We explore the combinations that seem to make sense given the uh, previous or the best value of the previous hyperparameter in this uh, ordering. Um, so there are also genetic algorithm approaches. We could take uh, a set of a random set of hyperparameter values from among the whole space and train a model with those settings, see how well it works. Um, and if it works well, maybe combine it with um, half of the hyperparameter settings from another uh, well-performing model to create a new uh, mashup uh, gene or combination of hyperparameter values um, and repeat that many times with different uh, uh, hyperparameter settings. Or there are also Bayesian methods. So you can try to do this even, uh, even smarter by making some kind of uh, assumption about the distribution of your hyperparameters. Like uh, probably if you're looking at the maximum depth of a tree and uh, seven seems to be working pretty well, then maybe it would be a good idea to focus on eight and nine rather than focus on one or 50 or something like that. So the Bayesian methods try to take the previous evidence that you have from your search so far and use that to decide where to uh, search next in the hyperparameter space. So for random search, we, uh, we try to, like grid search, we enumerate all possible combinations or we define continuous ranges uh, for them, but we only evaluate a random set of them. So that's very easy to implement. And in theory, if you add a new hyperparameter to the space that is unimportant, it will not have any ill effects. Um, although if it is important, but uh, in a bad way, uh, like changing that value is going to make your models worse, then it will uh, have a, a bad impact on your search. Um, the downside is that many hyperparameters have really large uh, possible ranges where their values do have detrimental effects, not just that they're unimportant, but that they have values where you would not like to explore them. Um, and these can dominate the search space. So 
For example, with an SVM, most values of C from a wide range of possibilities might not really work at all. They might be way too uh, overfit or they might be way too simple for your data set. So including those values is going to make the uh, random search spend much of its budget on, um, on solutions or possible solutions where the, uh, the hyperparameter values are just not giving it a chance at all. But uh, it is very easy to implement. I have an example um, from scikit-learn in Python here, where we have a simple data set with a logistic regression. Um, and here we define some hyperparameters, so some C values of C, and then a couple different kinds of, uh, of uh, regularization that we would like. And then the randomized search CV um, is a cross valid randomized search cross validation function that can take that uh, model and the hyperparameters that we want to search, the space of them, um, and then uh, search for the, the best set of hyperparameters in a cross validated cross-validated way um, and come up with uh, the answer for what were the best uh, hyperparameters. So with um, coordinate descent, we are uh, starting with default settings for hyperparameters and then finding the best value for one of those hyperparameters and choosing the order requires maybe a little bit of, of uh, expert knowledge for what you think is the most important hyperparameter to start with. Um, and then find the best value for the next one, given that previous best hyperparameter value and repeating that over and over again. And then maybe going back to step two, possibly several times to help to try to partially resolve dependencies between hyperparameters, because maybe the, the hyperparameter in step two is really uh, related to the hyperparameter in step five. And uh, once you change the value of one of them, you're gonna wanna change the value of the other one. So the, the pros of this is that adding new hyperparameters only increases the search space linearly. So it's, a, it's much more tractable to search a, a bigger space and adding a bad hyperparameter value doesn't change the search results unlike a, a randomized search. So it's only going to add a linear amount of time, however many bad hyperparameter or useless hyperparameter values you added um, it's going to spend some time on those, but it's, uh, it's not going to affect the results. Um, the con is that uh, one or the order of those parameters matters a lot uh, for avoiding getting stuck in a local minimum because we're not exploring the grid of all combinations. So choosing the order of, of hyperparameters to explore um, it can have a big difference on the outcome. Um, so that it doesn't resolve dependencies between hyperparameters as well as grid search uh, because it doesn't try all of the possible combinations like grid search does. So I have an example here. Um, this is from this is some R code from uh, the project I mentioned previously, where we can see all of the a grid of all of the hyperparameters that I tried. There are many many uh, different hyperparameter settings. Um, and then the, the start point, which is like the, just the default settings copied from the, um, from the uh, classifier uh, documentation. Uh, and this is for XGBoost. So we have some starting point in our hyperparameter search space. And then we go through some number of coordinate descent rounds, in this case, five, I think. And we say, let's go through each hyperparameter and uh, search for all of the values or try every value of that hyperparameter, um, set it in our current solution and train a model with those settings. And then we'll see if it has a better uh, RMSE, root mean squared error. And if so, we'll save that as the new uh, best value for this particular hyperparameter. And then at the end, we'll set that, that hyperparameter to the best value for that hyperparameter. Um, and then continue on to the next hyperparameter and so on through all of the uh, hyperparameters that we have defined in this HP space uh, variable. 
So with genetic algorithms, we're randomly um, initializing some number of hyperparameter combinations, which we can think of as the genes in the genetic algorithm, and evaluating how good a gene is or how fit a gene is in genetic algorithm terms by training and then uh, validating those models. Um, and then we combine the best genes and perform some random mu mutations um, to create a new generation. Uh, that's a, should say generation uh, and return to step two some number of, of times or until the solution stops improving very much. Um, so again, we can limit the amount of searching that we do by, uh, by defining the size of the gene pool and how many uh, times we're willing to return back to uh, step two in this process. Um, so we can, uh, we can limit the budget of, of uh, how long we're willing to search uh, according to how many models we're, we're willing to train to, to evaluate each gene. Um, so then some of the nice things about genetic algorithms is that they work with um, continuous ranges of hyperparameter values. So uh, some of them can take any continuous value um, and you can just randomly choose from among those values in a genetic algorithm. Um, it's a non-exhaustive search, so it doesn't take forever. Um, it, it can be given a specific budget of how long you're willing to spend. Um, and it tends to uh, favor promising areas of the search space, unlike the randomized search where we, uh, we don't use any intuition about where we should be, be looking in the search space. The con is that this is difficult to implement. I don't have any good code examples um, because the, um, uh, they're just not really out there yet. Um, although there, there's some work on that area, but it's not in any of the, the major uh, machine learning tools uh, that I'm aware of, at least. Um, and it has some of the same problems as, as random uh, search, where including possible bad hyperparameter values is going to tank that, that gene, cause it to not be very fit. Um, but it's less of a problem because that can get selected out of the gene pool in the next round. And a variation of that is Bayesian methods, which is um, related where we randomly try some hyperparameter options, like in a genetic algorithm. Um, and we, but then we train a model to try to predict the model accuracy based on the hyperparameter settings. So it's uh, uh, getting one step uh, deeper into the inception of, of uh, machine learning. Uh, we're trying to predict how well our machine learning model is going to work based on the hyperparameters. And then we sample new hyperparameter options to try based on expectations from number two. So uh, what uh, uh, values of hyperparameters are likely to work even better given whatever model we uh, trained based on our uh, experiments from step one. And then we can just go back to step two a certain number of times um, so again, we can give it a budget of how long we're willing to explore this space. So this concentrates the search area in good areas of the hyperparameter space, uh, which is a, a big pro. Um, and we can reuse what has been learned from this particular data set for new similar tasks, at least in theory. If you have a new data set that's similar, maybe similar types of features or similar number of features or similar in some other way, uh, we can maybe use some of what we learned from the past data set about what hyperparameters are likely to work well for this data set. Um, so this can sometimes, however, require some hyperparameter tuning itself, like hyper hyperparameters, to avoid some local minima in this uh, search process, because you have to decide um, how much should you do random exploration versus um, how much should you focus on good areas of the search space of hyperparameters? Um, and this one is, in, in theory, a bit difficult to implement, but there are, are actually uh, decent libraries for this, um, although uh, some of them need updating lately, I think. Uh, so one of those is, um, is called Bayes Search CV in Python, compatible with uh, scikit-learn. Um, and I think this one is last I checked kind of uh, not updated very much anymore, but uh, it still works pretty well. Um, 
So in this case, we have a grid of hyperparameters and we can define a range of values. So uh, we don't have to specify individual uh, values, but here we just say a uniform distribution from 0 0.001 to one. And the same thing for these other parameters, defining some uh, continuous distribution of uh, possible hyperparameter values. Um, so there's a question about whether there's an R library version of, of this uh, functionality. And uh, that's an excellent question. I don't know. But uh, if, you, uh, if you search for Bayesian hyperparameter optimization in R, you might find something. Um, I would start probably with the caret package, C-A-R-E-T, if you haven't already looked through that. Um, that's sort of the go-to um, R machine learning uh, package that would probably be the most likely um, to have some functionality like this um, if it exists for R. So def defining the hyperparameter space um, itself can be a little bit of a, a problem. Sometimes it's very easy, like uh, sometimes you'll just want to try uh, feature sampling in a random forest for most of the zero to one range, like almost none of the features to almost all of the features. But sometimes this can be a very tough problem. So for some uh, hyperparameters, there's no limits, like the C parameter in an SVM. It can go from, uh, from just above zero to uh, infinity, um, although realistically, uh, probably not. Uh, so there's some kind of uh, uh, heuristics for what a good range might be. Um, and, but for some parameters, you might even actually need to train a model to have a clue for what reasonable ranges of that hyperparameter are. Um, so to back up a second, uh, for example, this hyperparameter, CCP alpha, this is the cost complexity pruning parameter. I, you'll notice I've set it from 0 to 0 0.004, which is a very uh, strange kind of uh, uh, range that looks um, suspiciously uh, customized. And it is, in fact, um, just, it's uh, selected based on uh, the results of a model that I trained just to discover what were uh, good values of that hyperparameter going to be. So that can be a little bit, bit of a trick to determine sometimes. Um, so there are different strategies for trying to cope with that, like exponential search for zero to infinity possible values where you might try zero and then one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, um, et cetera. Uh, or iterative refinement, like the Bayesian approach, maybe pick some uh, values that you hope are much uh, bigger uh, than the reasonable range and uh, quickly narrow it down to what is a reasonable range um, or use some very standard ranges. So like SVM and logistic regression hyperparameters, especially the, the C complexity parameter. Uh, almost everybody uses powers of 10 ranging from about 0 0.001 to 1000 ish. Um, or you can make some uh, reasonable guesses like for decision trees. You might uh, make some guess based on the data set size, um, how much complexity you're willing to allow, how, uh, how many branches you're willing to have in this tree before you think it's probably overfitting to your particular data set. So for example, the cost complexity pruning parameter that I mentioned before has a, a possible range from zero to uh, infinity, but the interpretation of that has to do with the um, the specific uh, uh, accuracy gain, essentially, for your particular data set at each split of the tree. So there's a little bit of an interaction between how easy your data set is for the machine learning, uh, for the tree to learn, um, as well as uh, how, how many instances there are um, and how many features and so on. So the reasonable hyperparameter range is totally uh, independent or totally dependent rather on the problem uh, and even um, is classifier uh, specific. So variations of trees might have different reasonable values. But in this case, it turns out to be about this particular range. So some of them can be a real problem to, uh, to try to uh, discover. But in this case, this is the, the code that I use to try to discover this. 
I built a very simple random forest classifier with default hyperparameter settings, fit it to my training data, um, and then went through every tree in the random forest uh, and tried to calculate what is the, uh, the cost complexity uh, for that particular tree, which just counts all of those branches in the, in the tree uh, and how much, uh, uh, how much change in, uh, in the, the cost or the error function there was at every branch. Uh, and then I just created a histogram of, of all of those for all the different trees to see uh, once we get to 0 0.004, uh, basically there's, uh, there are no values that come up past that point. So a uh, quick uh, summary so far, um, two near hyperparameters, use nested cross-validation when you do so, so you don't overfit them, uh, and keep the computational complex complexity in mind when you're deciding on a uh, hyperparameter search strategy, because some of them are, uh, are really computationally demanding. Uh, so there are some very uh, cutting edge methods for trying to do this. Uh, one of them is uh, auto ML, automatic machine learning, uh, which is a hot area of, of uh, research that tries to automate all of the hyperparameter search process. So for example, what classifier to use, what hyperparameters to use for the classifier, um, and even what pre-processing should be done to the features. You can think of those all as hyperparameters that you would normally choose, but uh, which the goal of AutoML is, um, uh, to optimize those for you. So uh, from one of the original AutoML papers, they define the problem um, as looking for, uh, or for every uh, uh, possible uh, training data that you get that consists of some features and labels uh, and testing data drawn from the same data distribution. And we have some resource, resource that resource budget, some computational budget we're willing to spend. Um, the goal is to automatically produce the predictions uh, without being given the classifier and the hyperparameters. Um, so this is just a very mathy way to describe uh, the problem, which is in plain English, just given some resources, some training data and labels and some testing data, we would like to automatically decide how to produce predicted labels for this uh, testing data. So there's an implementation of this in Python called auto SK learn, uh, which tries to do uh, to automate the whole hyperparameter search space. Um, it also includes some, some non scikit learn models like XGBoost that are uh, pretty popular. So it defines the uh, cache problem, which stands for combined algorithm selection and hyperparameter optimization. So they, they treat the selection of machine learning algorithm as step one, and then the hyperparameters for that algorithm as a second step. So the key concepts for the cache problem is that the set of algorithms or methods we could use is a domain and hyperparameters also have domains that are dependent on which algorithm you use. Um, and then feature pre-processing methods are also a, a uh, domain uh, which AutoSK Learn considers a hyperparameter, uh, but that's not a very algorithm dependent domain because you can do a lot of the same pre-processing methods regardless of what type of model you use. So for optimizing this cache problem, a Bayesian network approach is pretty, uh, pretty natural choice. So the objective function is trying to, uh, to optimize the accuracy or minimize the cross-validated loss. And we have some independent probabilities, which is what algorithm is best to use, and some conditional probabilities, which is what hyperparameters are best given a particular algorithm. So um, you can imagine a Bayesian network where each of these things relates uh, is dependent on each other as appropriate and the objective function is dependent on all of those things. But ultimately the auto SK learn team found that just using a random forest uh, tended to work better than a, uh, a more bespoke approach anyway. 
But that brings up the question of what is the best algorithm for trying to optimize the cache problem? Uh, given, however, circling all the way back to the beginning, uh, given the no free lunch theorem, there's actually not a best choice for optimizing this problem either. So in their experiments, they found that a random forest tended to work best, but in practice, that doesn't mean that that is the best algorithm for optimizing the problem of deciding what algorithm to use. So this is a little bit of an inception problem where we, we try to go one step back and automate each, uh, each step of the uh, machine learning process, but ultimately we're just faced with the same problem at every step, uh, which is that there is no uh, optimal solution. Uh, so in their, in their solution though, they, they are given some uh, some training data, some testing data, um, and then they do this meta learning uh, process. Uh, the meta learning process is where they try to learn about what hyperparameters are likely to work on this data given some properties of the data set. Um, and then they have this Bayesian problem where given some pre processing and uh, classifier. Uh, settings, what are good hyperparameters to use um, to ultimately create a prediction. And then they create a prediction with the best 50 models that they explored. So the meta features that it learns um, are 38 different features about the data set itself. So it tries to learn about the cache problem itself over time. Um, so it extracts features of the data set, like how many features there are and um, what are their ranges and uh, how many unique values they have and standard deviations and all sorts of things like that. And then it tries to find the k equals 25 nearest neighbors um, of, the, of those meta features to decide where to initialize this uh, this Bayesian learning process, like which hyperparameter settings to choose initially when, uh, when deciding um, how to uh, solve the, the cache problem. So the automatic ensemble construction step um, is motivated by the fact that many of the models built along the way during this process might be good or might be complementary. Um, they might be accurate on different types of instances. So Auto SK Learn keeps track of the, the best 50 models um, as it goes, and then automatically builds an ensemble of those at the end. So essentially it just does forward feature selection. It adds one model at a time uh, and picks whichever model with replacement improves the result the best in terms of uh, voting um, all of the predictions of those models together, just averaging them together. So it really considers a huge range of, of algorithms and uh, hyperparameters. That's what, that's what this lambda column is, how many different hyperparameters it tries to tune for that particular algorithm, uh, which is a lot. And uh, so it really explores the space quite a bit, including many different pre-processing methods uh, like PCA and uh, uh, random trees embeddings and one hot encoding and all sorts of uh, different transformations. And so a simple example of that is with the uh, the popular toy data set MNIST, which uh, uh, is a handwritten digit classification data set, very easy to get a good result on, uh, but it's a good example of of a very simple example of how this works. We just load data, um, we train it or we split it into some training and testing data. And then all we have to do is apply our, um, our auto scalar and classifier, um, fit it and it will automatically do that whole process given some budget which defaults to one hour worth of uh, computational time. So that seems great, but there are some issues uh, certainly with this approach, one of which is reproducibility. Uh, because the computation is time limited, you can't really, uh, even setting a random seed at the beginning won't give you the same results the second time because 
um, your computer will run a different number of, of uh, cycles in the same amount of time. Um, and it, it also depends how long, or it requires a good budget for uh, time, how long you're willing to spend. The paper that published this initially required 10.7 CPU years to do all of their experiments, which is a really long time. And that is the biggest drawback with this approach in my experience when I've tried to use it on some uh, learning analytics uh, data sets. Sometimes it works pretty well, but, um, but you have to give it a pretty big budget for it to, uh, to really be able to do a good job. And with a small budget of time, um, what it ends up doing is just not exploring complex models at all. So you might actually be restricting it to only simple models and not uh, even really being, not even really realizing it. Another problem I've run into trying to deploy uh, models learned with auto SK learn in practice is that these, uh, these trained models tend to be super complicated since they're an ensemble of 50 different models, which might also be individually complicated. So for example, um, in one project where we were trying to um, measure collaboration between uh, students who were working on tablet computers, we tried an auto SK learn approach that uh, did a little bit better than our um, than our initial random forest uh, uh, sort of vanilla algorithm. But ultimately, that model that came out of Auto SK Learn was so big that um, it wasn't really feasible to uh, actually run that uh, prediction model on our um, server that we were using to, uh, to generate these collaboration uh, predictions in real time. So there's some practical downsides as well. Um, and one other problem, which is a much larger issue, is that it doesn't work well on problems that are better solved for, by deep learning uh, because it's, it's just built for uh, structured uh, data kinds of, of problems. So it can work on MNIST, which is an image data set, which might be surprising, but MNIST is so simple that even uh, just doing PCA and using k-nearest neighbors can work pretty well. Um, so if you are dealing with a problem where uh, a deep learning approach is probably a, a better uh, solution or seems like a more natural fit for your data, um, for example, if you're doing a, a perception task like, uh, like uh, emotion recognition or, um, or recognition of, of student speech, for example, you might want to use a deep neural network, uh, but then you have so many uh, new kinds of hyperparameters um, including sh the structure of the neural network itself and the possibilities for that are infinite. So many, uh, you could make a, a network with uh, infinitely many different uh, combinations of layers and widths of each layer and settings for each layer. And so instead there are many broad categories of structures that uh, people usually search. Um, so like variations of uh, mobile net or VGG or one of these uh, popular networks that is designed to be easily tweaked via just a few hyperparameters. So, but then we have basically the same problem as before for some set of appropriate network structures like model types, we want to test a large range of hyperparameters and climb towards a better solution, find what the good range of hyperparameters likely is. So for example, uh, ResNet is a very famous one. This has some hyperparameters that are just depth and width, pretty easy to adjust. Um, ResNext is a very similar type of model with similar hyperparameters, uh, but there are variations like DenseNet, which has different uh, hyperparameters. Um, or very bespoke architectures like uh, Google Net, which is very difficult to um, define hyperparameter domains even to search since the structure is so complicated. So here's a, a visualization of the Google Net uh, structure uh, where it has each one of these layers uh, or many of the layers anyway, have some variations from the one that came before and have some different uh, kinds of um, tweaks made to each one based on things that seem to work well, but uh, which makes it very difficult to say, um, I want to increase the size of this network or I want to increase the width of this network or some kind of, of uh, 
hyperparameter like that. The other problem with hyperparameter uh, optimization for neural networks is that it's very, very, very expensive to, um, to train a model to decide what a good hyperparameter is. So evaluating a model is so expensive, you can only do it a few times if you're lucky. So the, uh, the only real solution is to make some very strong assumptions about the relationship between hyperparameters and results. So a common way of, of implementing hyperparameter search then is with a Gaussian process where we try to model conceptually related groups of hyperparameters, um, which is often just uh, one or two hyperparameters and update a, um, a kernel position based on um, expected improvement. And I can uh, link to a paper if you're curious about the, um, the exact uh, meaning of that. But basically, we have a Gaussian kernel. Uh, we make some kind of, of uh, normally distributed or at least uh, approximately uh, linear related assumption about possible hyperparameter values uh, so that we can choose exact positions in the space that we think are going to optimize our results. And we can only afford to do that a few times given the, the cost typically of training a neural network structure. Then there are similar ideas um, for uh, also for neural networks. Um, TPE, tree structured parson estimator is probably the most uh, popular method for this, um, which is the same kind of idea, but where we're using a, some kind of tree-based uh, predictive model to predict where the possible ranges of good hyperparameter combinations are. So this is very closely related to the cache problem that I mentioned earlier, or the, um, the Bayesian uh, 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 hyperparameter search process, where we train a model to predict uh, what hyperparameters are going to be good. Uh, for the model that we actually care about. So the tree in this case predicts where some Gaussian or other probability distribution should be placed within the hyperparameter search space to, uh, to predict what our values of hyperparameters should be or what the possible reasonable ranges of values are. So a more complex tree um, with more branches means more places to search uh, and more complexity of the hyperparameter search process, but maybe better results. Uh, but it, it requires a bigger budget of training. So there's this, uh, this paper by Bergstra et al. that compares uh, these uh, strategies to human experts for trying to tune neural network parameters by hand, which is uh, uh, often the way that this actually goes, um, even in uh, learning analytics applications. Um, and they found that humans are not much better than just randomly searching for hyperparameter combinations and humans were a lot slower. So in a given time budget, uh, humans try 82 uh, sets of hyperparameters for one data set and 27 for another. Um, the machines were limited to 200 combinations total uh, in the same amount of time. Uh, and the, the machines were ultimately a bit more successful in finding good hyperparameters. So here the, um, the loss lower means lower is better. Um, and for these two data sets, the, uh, the tree pars and estimator approach, the more, most complicated approach uh, beat out the other approaches, including uh, humans or just randomly searching. So there's a package for this if you're really curious about the details of, of uh, hyperparameter searching for uh, neural networks. There are actually a few different ones now. Um, one soon to be implemented directly in TensorFlow or maybe already there. Uh, but these are just packages for implementing, implementing random search or um, TPE in uh, in the neural network hyperparameter optimization process. Um, and this adds all sorts of additional complexities like um, using MongoDB for supercomputer experiments because you actually run all of your models on separate computers and you need to coordinate the 
hyperparameter search space across computers. And I have done some of this for, um, for some uh, student modeling problems, but uh, I'm always reminded, uh, or I like to remind myself of the no free lunch theorem and recall that um, all of these fancy approaches may not actually be any better than just training a, a random forest on the data set on my own computer. Um, so I'm just going to um, skip through a couple of these. Uh, I have a few more slides than my uh, budget uh, of time that I've given myself actually allows for, but uh, I want to get to some examples at the end. So some common computational bottlenecks though are very important to point out. Um, things like wrapper feature selection, it, that is a a uh, hyperparameter optimization strategy where we're selecting what features to go into the model. Um, and choice of features is essentially a hyperparameter. Uh, but all of these things can be pretty slow. And it's uh, really important to be on the lookout for computational bottlenecks when you're um, searching for hyperparameters. Uh, and uh, just uh, being a bit wise about that and uh, stopping your experiments if it seems like they're going to uh, take forever. So um, I do have a, a demo here of a, um, a couple uh, problems that I wanted to illustrate with hyperparameter optimization and then how to do them correctly. So I have this randomly generated data set, which you can uh, download if you like. I'm going to do that uh, right now and just save it to my um, downloads folder. So I'm going to show you how to do this um, this particular demo in Weka, uh, which is a graphical machine learning tool that's um, maybe not as popular now as it used to be, but still uh, used sometimes in learning analytics. And then I'll have a, another demo in a second uh, using Python. So I'm going to try uh, share Weka with you now. So hopefully you can see that now instead of my slides. So I'm just going to open that file, which you probably cannot see me selecting this since this is on a, a new window, but I'm going to open that uh, example CSV file. So the, the key thing to point out here is that I randomly generated this data set. Um, so it has no, um, in theory, there should be no relationships between the features and the labels. So there's uh, uh, the labels are just um, zeros and ones. Um, and for Weka to deal with those properly, I'm going to convert those to, uh, to nominal values. So I'll apply a numeric to nominal filter to only the last feature, which is the, uh, the class value. So now I have all of these outcomes that are zeros and ones um, and all of these uh, input features. So I can classify this with um, logistic regression. Let's see, uh, with just the default uh, hyperparameters uh, to predict uh, nominal. And if I run that, I get a kappa of 0.04. So that means basically nothing. Basically, the, there was nothing to learn, uh, or the model did not learn anything in this data set. The MCC backs that up, um, and the, the ROC is also pretty close to 0.5, which is chance level for that. So there is nothing really to uh, learn, and our model did not, uh, hence did not really learn anything. But now if we do the, um, the feature selection step, we can apply Weka's built-in uh, uh, feature, select feature selection tool. We'll use CFS subset eval, which is the default tool. Uh, and we'll just run that. It tells us that the best features are uh, 456 and 484. And keep in mind, um, I ran this on the full training data set. So I did not do the uh, proper nested cross-validation. Um, although even the this setting in Weka will also actually not do um, nested cross validation, it will only do uh, cross validation. Um, so if we then go back to let's go back to pre-process and select everything except 
those features that we want to keep. Four, five, six, and four, eight, four, I think it was. And the outcome. And then we'll just uh, delete all of those other ones. Now we have just the features that were selected um, and the outcome. And we'll uh, try this again, run it again. Um, and now we get a cap of 0.22, which actually starts to look like there's something there in this data set. But there isn't. It is uh, just a random data set. But um, because I have uh, overfit the, uh, the feature selection process to the uh, data set, I was able to get a feature or a result that seemed like, uh, like something was actually going on in the data set. So I wanted to include that as a little bit of a cautionary tale about uh, 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 selecting features. And then I'm going to show you another uh, similar example with a uh, Python demo. So I'm going to download that uh, file and then uh, open it. If I can get Zoom to play nice. Let me uh, let's see. I have to figure out how to get my uh, downloads folder to show up. OK, there we go. So I'm going to share this, um, this other uh, window now, which will be the code for this uh, Python example. So I'm going to use that same data set, which is in my downloads folder. Um, and what this code is going to do is um, it's going to do proper, it's not going to do cross or feature selection at all. Um, it's going to um, just do cross valid, fourfold cross validation, and it's going to iterate via grid search over um, some SVM hyperparameter values and some logistic regression, um, and then some decision tree hyperparameter values. Oops. So. If I run this, I see it's going to print out all of this different stuff about what hyperparameter values um, were used uh, and how they worked on the testing data set. So we might look through all of these and say, uh, oh, this uh, logistic regression with a C of, of a 0.1 regularization parameter actually works uh, the best out of all of these different classifier, uh, different classifiers with different hyperparameter options. So I'm going to use logistic regression with this particular hyperparameter. But again, we have uh, overfit the hyperparameter selection process to the data. So it should be a zero kappa result. And instead, we're getting something that looks like better than zero because we chose the best hyperparameters based on the testing data rather than on the training data. Um, so if we do that, um, then at the very end, I included a version where we do logistic regression the, the correct way. So it's just some example, some example code of how you can use um, the uh, scikit-learn functionality to do uh, a cross-validated, nested cross-validation search for good hyperparameter values um, so that we end up with hyperparameter values that are chosen based on the training data, not based on the testing data. And we, when we do that, we end up with a much more modest kappa that's pretty close to zero. I would bet the confidence interval actually uh, includes zero and it has not um, really actually learned it anything. Um, which is correct because this data set is indeed random numbers. And uh, so we should just come up with a zero result. Um, so these, uh, these links um, are, uh, should be publicly accessible. So I'll leave those up if you would like to see the, the code or the data set uh, to play around with that um, yourself. Um, and then uh, that's all I have for you today. Uh, you can email me if you like. I realize I accidentally gave you two different email addresses. So feel free to choose from the first slide or the last slide email address. Uh, I'm always happy to, uh, to chat about these kinds of topics uh, and happy to take any questions if you have any.
Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to go ahead and uh, turn on your microphone or put it in the chat. Or if you think of anything later, def definitely uh, send an email or we can use the resource center for learning network too. That's great. Well, thanks for everybody for staying. Um, if you, again, have anything, please send an email. Um, we will go ahead and stop the 